The Southern Cross Crime Panel is a miracle in itself. Um, Craig Sisterson just brings together, well, seven authors, I think six authors, six authors in the end, um, from various parts of the world. And accordingly, um, you will see as you watch, um, there's maybe a little bit of a hiccup with uh, the camera of one of the authors. Sometimes the sound uh, quality isn't as, as, as sharp as, as we or you, I know, would like it to be. But I think the notion that so many people beaming in uh, from those different parts. And please, again, it was late at night in the UK when we recorded and very early in the morning for those authors on the other side of the world in Australia and New Zealand. So, you know, we beg your patience uh, and we hope that you enjoy this amazing gathering uh, of Southern Cross crime writers. G'day and kia ora. Welcome and hi my. My name's Craig Sisterson and I'm really pleased to welcome everyone watching today to our Southern Cross Crime or Antipodean Noir panel. We're super excited to bring this to you. We were devastated that we couldn't be there in person at Newcastle Noir. Such a wonderful festival. Jackie Collins and her team do amazing, amazing things. But we're really glad that we can still bring this Australian and New Zealand crime fiction panel to you all here. It's my great pleasure to be with Kirsten McKenzie, Charity Norman, and Helen Fitzgerald, three incredibly fine Antipodean crime writers. We're spread all around the world, but we're bringing the world to you here, thanks to um, Zoom and YouTube and all the other online things. I'm gonna do just a really quick introduction to the panel, and then they're gonna get talking, because you don't wanna hear from me, you wanna hear from them, so let's get into it. To my, oh, I'm not going to do this because I don't know if we're going to move as everyone goes. <laughs> so coming to us from uh, the uh, up north in Scotland, we have an Australian Scot or a Glasgow Ocker, Glasgow Australian, Glasgow Sheila perhaps, <laughs> and Helen Fitzgerald, who's an Australian-born crime writer who writes a, a range of novels. Um, and she's been based up in Glasgow for many years now. We'll talk more about that later. Her latest book is Ash Mountain, where she actually returns home to Australia, and we're going to be talking about that. And But first, I just want to say congratulations, Helen, because worst case scenario, her most recent book before Ash Mountain has just been longlisted for the Theakston's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year Award. So well done, Helen. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> We also have with us Charity Norman calling in the whole way from New Zealand. Uh, early morning there. Thanks for getting up, Charity. And Charity has written several uh, novels, several standalone kind of psychological thrillers, psychological suspense and mystery. Her past novel, her most recent one up till now, which was um, See You in September, was a finalist for the 2018 Nye Marsh Awards in New Zealand. And her brand new book, The Se Secrets of Strangers, has just been released during COVID lockdown. So we'll be talking about that. Welcome, Charity. And we also have Kirsten McKenzie, also calling in the whole way from Auckland, New Zealand. So thanks so much for joining us this morning, Kirsten. Kirsten is a genre blending writer. She's written some time slip mysteries. She's also written some kind of dark thrillers that are kind of horror, but also thrillers. So all of us in the crime and thriller writing community really like them as well. She's written five books and she's got a sixth one coming out very soon in a few weeks, which is called The Forger and the Thief. And that's set in 1960s Florence, I believe, Kirsten, is that right? I haven't read it yet because it's not out yet, but looking forward to it. So welcome to our panel. As I said, my name is Craig Sisterson. I'm a journalist from New Zealand, currently based in London. I started the Naya Marsh Awards. I co-founded the Rotorua Noir Festival, and I'm the author of Southern Cross Crime, a guidebook to Australia and New Zealand. Enough about me. Let's get to the wonderful ladies. Kirsten, perhaps you'd like to first tell us about your new book and what the kind of idea is behind that and getting into writing that, The Forger and the Thief. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everyone from around the world. Uh, the Forger and the Thief will be out in July. Craig's right. It's set in 1966 Florence, <laughs> Italy. Um, obviously, nobody can go to Italy right now. Who knew? Um, but I did manage to go to Italy some years ago, and in 1966, Florence was struck by the most incredible um, floods when the Arno flooded, 
and it took out <clears throat> many of uh, Florence's cultural treasures and artworks and uh, and of course if you think if you take that little scenario and then you add in the the pillaging of all the art throughout Europe by the Nazis you mix it all together with a, a museum cleaner who has access to everything and nobody ever notices the cleaner add it together with an art student who lost all her family in the war add to it a uh, wedding guest who should never have been invited, uh, a woman on the run from her husband, you know, everyone's got all their secrets, put them together with a bit of a flood and uh, all the bones start appearing, literally uncovered by the waters. Wonderful. And Helen, your new one also has kind of a natural disaster at the centre of it as well, not flood but fire. Can you tell us about that and why you decided to return home to an Australian setting this time? So I, I decided to return home to Australian setting because I felt like for the first time in about, since I started writing about 20 years ago, that I was allowed to. <laughs> so, because I'd always been encouraged to write uh, UK only, maybe America, the, you know, the best thing would be UK and America. Um, so I, after the cry came out, I think it was kind of, you know, I was, I just kind of felt confident to say, no, I'm setting this one in Australia. Um, and I wanted to write about a small town um, like the one I grew up in, which uh, has really had one disaster after another when I think about its history. Um, and the fire really is just another one of those. It's really about a town that sort of had uh, been infected really by uh, Morris Brothers College. Um, and that's one of the things, but it's sort of like a the cycle of abuse that this town has really sort of um, has had over the years. So, um, yeah, it's really hard to describe this book. I'm still trying to work out how. In fact, it's really useful when you get re reviews and you think, oh, yeah, that's what it's about. <laughs> yeah, I've seen disaster thriller and other things kind of in there, but it's so much more than that. Um, I, I read it a few weeks ago, absolutely loved it. And it's, there's so much going on with the small town secrets, rural noir stuff, then you've got the family drama, then you've got the fire, and then you've kind of got the whole... Catholic Church stuff, which has obviously kicked into gear most recently in Australia. We won't get into that too much. We'll be talking for hours um, about Cardinal Pell and his pals. Um, so perhaps we should instead go to Charity. And Charity, you've kind of done the opposite. Um, you were kind of born in, in Africa and, and then you grew up in the UK. Now you've lived in New Zealand for quite a long time. Your book before this was set in New Zealand mainly, but also a little bit in the UK, but now you've actually set the new one in London, in a London cafe, I believe. That's right, yes, yes. Moved, some have been set in, in, um, in uh, the UK and some in New Zealand with little hints of East Africa in some of them as well. Um, but this one is set in London, a cafe in Balham, Tuckbox, ca ca Tuckbox Cafe, which is near Balham Tube and Railway Stations. A, a, an area you probably know pretty well, and um, which yeah, I that's certainly... literally two tube stops up from me. <laughs> <So it's... laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah, well, and I do too. Yeah, so it may bump into you in Tuckbox Cafe one day, yes, and it's, you know, it's, it's a normal Monday morning in in the cafe we can all imagine, and various commuters and people coming off their night shifts are, are, are going there, you know, to get their takeaways and have their cups of tea with their grandchildren before school and so on. And, and so it's crowded early in the morning when a, a gunman, an apparently crazed gunman, runs in, shots are fired, there's pandemonium, um, and he locks the doors and a number of people are taken hostage. And the rest of the story really is uh, uh, about who, who is there with him, what are their stories and how they begin to intertwine with his. And it's really a, it's really a why done it rather than a who done it. You know, who is he and what's his story? And so over the course of the day of about 12 hours, the stories of those people who are with him begin to emerge. There's a, a nurse um, who's just come off a night shift who um, came through the Rwandan genocide and there's a homeless guy with a gambling habit and there's a barrister um, who's on her way to court. And so what happens when you get all these people trapped in a cafe with a crazed gunman? That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's been some, I've got it sitting on my, it's actually by my bedside table at the moment, so that's one of my next reads I'm really looking forward to, but I've seen some great reviews of it, it's getting a, um, it's getting a pretty good response so far, as is Ash Mountain, there's a lot of great reviews out there for Ash Mountain as well, which is really good. What's it been like for you guys um, kind of releasing a book 
kind of during this COVID pandemic and, and lockdown? Because I know, Helen, that yours, it, it kind of like, I know the ebook was out earlier, but has the paperback been affected? I, I think the Australian date's been pushed back, I saw. And, and Charity, you're releasing the book during it, and Kirsten, yours has kind of been pushed back a little bit into July, or perhaps was that due to the pandemic was, as well? I was going to bring it with me to, uh, to Newcastle. Mm. And then when this all kicked off in March, it was just impossible to to do anything further with it. Mm. That's very much so. Yes, um, yeah, Newcastle was actually going to be the literally the first event that my book was going to be available, but the print copy has been pushed back. So just the yeah. ebook and audio book now. Um, and because yeah, Helen, yours has been affected a little bit as well, has it? I think yeah, like it's so kind of. It was supposed to be out in May in paperback here, but it's going to be out in August here. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, it was supposed to be September or October, and that's going to be at least March. They want me to go over, so it depends when we can fly. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been disappointing from the um, you know the fun that you have at the festivals mainly, especially mm. when you are coming out. There's just the buzz. I'm going to miss that it may never happen again you know <laughs> yeah no, it is it's really tricky and because this was going to be like a homecoming for you wasn't it charity because you used to work up near newcastle as a lawyer before you moved to new zealand yes i did i was a barrister um for 15 years out of york and newcastle chambers so it would have been would have been coming home it's a bad time to release a book there's no doubt here in new zealand my this book came out in um the start of March and you know there it is on the bookshelves and everyone's excited and then mid-March the doors are locked completely there was no online sales nothing no bookshop could sell a single book so you could actually look through the windows and see piles of it on the shelves you know so gathering dust and uh, so it, it, we're all in the same boat aren't we but it's just mm. a terrible time to release book and um, I've been lucky in England in that it's a Radio 2 choice which gets a bit more coverage and air oxygen but um book, book sales are down across the board aren't they right around the world and then of course oh, in New Zealand, we've got that added problem of all our magazines have just closed down yes yeah, a lot of the main ones yeah yeah i know so, i write for some of them <laughs> so, <I know. laughs> yeah it's hopefully hopefully there'll be a resurrection down the track for a couple of the main ones there Fingers crossed. Oh, I think, oh, who do we have here? We have a special guest and he may not be our only special guest. We would, we thought, the four of us here, that since we were giving you a virtual online panel brought from all around the world, rather than in person in Newcastle, why not bring in some friends too? We might as well take advantage. And it's our pleasure to welcome Alan Carter, the whole way from Tasmania. Alan writes the Cato Kwong series set in Western Australia, which has won a Ned Kelly Award. He's also written a so far standalone that's going to become a series, Marlborough Man, set in New Zealand, when he was living in the top of the South Island for a while. And that won the Nye Marsh Award. He's one of a rare author to win both the New Zealand and Australian Crime Writing Awards. So we can both kind of claim him, though he is actually from England originally. Welcome, Alan. Can you hear us all okay? Okay. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for getting up so early. It's even earlier in Australia than it is in New Zealand. Right, I've got an early hairstyle at the moment. Excuse me. <laughs> Good morning, Alan. Good morning. Hello, Kirsten. Hello, Charity. Hello, Helen. Hello. Anybody listening? Hi. You're the first of our special guests to arrive. We'll keep the others mysterious until they may or may not call in, depending on how they slept or what time they got up or how much coffee they had. Now's probably a good time to start talking about Australian and New Zealand crime fiction a bit more in general. Um, earlier on, Alan, just before you joined us, the ladies were talking about how, um, and, and especially Helen, who's been writing for the longest out of us, that she was kind of discouraged from setting her books in Australia or in Australia and New Zealand, um, even being Australian. And Michael Robotham has said the same thing many times, including recently, um, about how often that, that happens for him as well. Oh, here we go. <laughs> it's another special guest calling in the whole way from Canberra. We have the marvelous Chris Hammer, who won last year's CWA John Creasy Dagger for best first novel, among some other accolades he's got along the way. Good morning, Chris. Can you hear us okay in Canberra? Might need a bit more volume from Chris there, Ross. Is it just sideways on most online? 
No, he's yeah, sideways. He's Chris yeah. is always a bit sideways. So, that's <laughs> so here you are, Newcastle Noir fans and audience goers. We're bringing you some extra special stuff as well. Chris, we were just um, talking about how historically Australian and New Zealand authors of all kinds, and particularly crime writers, have been discouraged from setting their books in Australia or New Zealand. Helen had this happen to herself when she started writing uh, kind of 15, 20 years ago now, Helen? I guess 20 now. So. Yeah. And um, I know Michael Robotham has said the same when he started about the same time. Um, how do you think that's changed in recent years? Perhaps, Helen, you want to talk about it since you brought the topic up, and then Alan and Chris can kind of dive in with their thoughts as well. Uh, well, it was so sort of Jane Harper's The Dry, I suppose, was the... Uh, for us over here, though, it wasn't crime so much, but the slap and things like that made people realise, I think, that you could watch Australian, New Zealand stuff and not be confused, <laughs> you know? Oh. Like, accessible, it's the same language as, you know. Um, I think Netflix and the streaming services as well, bringing a lot of TV from different places had a big impact. Um, those are the two things that come to mind for me, anyway. And Alan, yourself, because you you immediately set your books in Australia, even as an English, a kind of English-born person living in Australia. Why did you feel comfortable with that at the time? So. Well, I, I pretty much have been away from England for so long, I've forgotten what it was like anyway. So I wouldn't have Good felt I wouldn't have felt confident writing about it. Um, so it, it was automatic to me to write about where I was and and what I knew better at the time, which was Australia. Um, but yeah, I think uh, Helen's right about the a combination of uh, certain books coming out, like say Jane Harper's book and, and other things that kind of have a strong sense of Australian place. But also, yes, that streaming of um, particularly crime series from different parts of the world, the Scandi Noir thing, which kind of, particularly in England, maybe gave people confidence that uh, yes, there might be some really good stories that could be told from elsewhere around the world and that they should have confidence in that. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's, that's probably the, the turning point, I think, which probably maybe about, I don't know, a decade ago. Yeah, there's definitely been an ongoing evolution. I mean, the dry is a big kind of tent post, or if you want to call it that, but there were obviously many things that happened before that that led up to it. Um, with, with other authors as well. And, and we're seeing just a, a flood. A little bit, I think like the Scandi Noir, um, Stig Larson and Henning Mankell kind of opened the doors for a lot of people, but there were really good authors before that, dating way back to the 60s with My Soul and Perualu and, and before Henning Mankell and that. But sometimes it takes publishers to see success to kind of open, open those doors. I know Peter Corris, the Sydney author, was strongly discouraged from writing his book set in Sydney, but he went ahead and did it. He got turned down by many publishers for not changing the location, but he finally got one to let him publish his Australian books, and the rest, they say, is history in terms of Australian crime fiction. Yeah. And certainly Peter Temple uh, never had any problem uh, right at the beginning of what he was doing to just see where he was from and what he was writing about and uh, kind of to hell with the consequences, really, and... and you have to take that view, I think, kind of, uh, to write what you know and what you like and what you want to write. Um, yeah. I think that's a good question for all of you, perhaps, because you've all set your books in, in um, kind of different places, either where you've lived and sometimes where you're setting them away from where you've lived. Um, I know, Helen, you've set books in Glasgow, Chris, and you've set some of yours kind of overseas in different time periods, Florence, but also Florida with Dr. Perry. Alan, you've set yours, you've tended to set yours where you actually lived, but you've got an outsider's perspective having been from somewhere else first. And, and Charity, you've kind of got the insider outsider thing with New Zealand and Europe as well. And, and Chris, you've set your books not in your hometown in Canberra, but somewhere that you're familiar with from all the research you did as a journalist. So there's that kind of interesting balance between being an insider and an outsider, setting it right where you live, slightly being slightly apart as a writer. Would perhaps um, some of you like to talk on that? Perhaps Chris, you'd like to start us off there. Yeah. And so when I came to write fiction, I was so sick of politics, I just didn't want to go there. So uh, 
but my settings came from other sort of non-fiction books that I read. Um, I think there is something, a feeling about a, a rural setting or a small town setting. So my first book, Scrublands, was set out in the bush. The second one is set in Kilda. The, the, um, my upcoming book, uh, Trust, which is out in yeah. October in Australia and early next year in the UK, it's actually set in Sydney. But uh, location is really important. I think it does have uh, a sort of a rural location has an appeal, I think, for city readers here in Australia and in all those cities in Melbourne. But I think it also probably has an appeal for readers in the UK and the US. Uh, some location that's you know, a little bit exotic, I guess. I always wonder that myself when people said, oh, don't set your books in New Zealand and Australia. Because growing up, I loved reading books set in places that were exotic to me, being a New Zealander, so all around the world. And I would have thought that people all around the world would have loved to have read books in Australia and New Zealand, which was turning out to be the case as recent years have shown. But for a long time, people were a little reluctant to that. Charity and Helen, you've both kind of um, bounced between urban and rural settings in your last couple of books. Charity, you're... The previous one was kind of rural New Zealand countryside and now your London city urban life. And Helen, your previous one was kind of um, Glasgow urban life and now you've gone to countryside Australia. So talk to us about the kind of research required or the, the different ways you perhaps approach telling stories in those different locations and how the locations bleed into the story. Charity, do you want to start us off? I have a slight problem. I think we bumped off Zoom. Can anybody actually see me? We can. Yeah, we can see you and hear you, Charity. Oh, that message and I should have said, now we can see you. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't see any of you. It's, it's, uh, so I'm just going to talk without being able to see you. I'm so sorry. So, um, yes, you've all disappeared and um, I'm being told my meeting will start in a few seconds. So um, We can see and hear you. We're just pulling really funny faces at you the whole time. So. <laughs> Well, that's that's pretty normal life for me. So I'm sorry. While I was while I was messing trying to get online again, I missed the end of your question, Craig. I'm sorry. Maybe I was talking about end. rural and urban settings. Both yourself and Helen have bounced between the two in your last two books, um, doing both yeah. countryside settings, but also doing uh, urban settings. Oh, hello. We have another special guest. You might not be hello. able to see her, Charity. So I'm just going to briefly pause before we get to Charity answering that question. Good morning to Emma Viscuit. From all the Hi, way from calling all the way in from Melbourne. Can you see everyone else? You should have um, six Can. other people you, apart from yourself. You all look remarkably awake. <laughs> Except maybe Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chris's camera is up the right way. Chris is just lying down on his kitchen bed. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So, so Emma, you, you've um, popped, I'll just do a really super quick introduction to everyone watching. Uh, this is Emma Viskic, one of the queens of crime of the modern era of Australian <laughs> crime writing. She's won the David Award and the Ned Kelly Award for her Caleb Zellick series. She was also shortlisted for the CWA Gold Dagger for Resurrection Bay, the first in the series. And her new one is just out soon. We'll talk to the, about that a little more, but we're just going to go back to Charity, where Charity was talking about kind of the difference between urban and rural settings because both um, Charity and Helen have set their last two books, one in a big city um, and one in the countryside. So we were talking about the difference of urban and rural settings and how you approach them and how that setting kind of bleeds in and affects the storyline. So Charity, if you want to dive in with any thoughts there. Well, the, yes, I, I have been thinking about that lately, actually, because when I began to write my most recent book, um, Secrets of Strangers, that was set in within the full, not only in an urban setting, but largely within the four walls of one room in which the, almost the entire action takes place. And that was completely different from the previous one, which was set on the shores of Lake Tarawera, um, you know, near Rotorua, sort of this enormous open rural setting with almost nobody there, just a cult living there. And so it does feel completely different. And, and it's sort of your, I think when you're writing, you tend to have this inner landscape, don't you, that's mimicking that that you're writing and, and the, the sort of shape of the story tends to follow that a bit. So for me to be within the confines of the streets of London and then within a cafe, it, it gave the story a different pace, I think almost almost without um, without me intending it. 
so I'm sure others have found the same thing. It is, it is a different experience when you write Lake Tarawera and you write Tuckbox Cafe London, um, I find. And, so, and you know, my others have been set in other places too. And you have to sort of move into that different landscape when you start to write. And, and Helen, your, your latest one is set in small town Victoria, which is a, a place where you grew up yourself in small town Victoria before kind of going overseas and stuff. But, and with the threat of bushfire and the small town secrets where everyone kind of knows each other or thinks they know each other, whether they do or not. And um, how was it setting a story there compared to your kind of European urban city stories that you've written well, in the past few times? It was um, interesting because as where I grew up, and I haven't been there to Kilmore since I left, when, you know, I was about 20, so I haven't been there for about 20 years. And I think for a, a long time I felt um, that, that I didn't have the right to write about Australia, really, because I haven't been living there. Someone else was saying that just now, weren't they? I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't see any of you. Um, but, yeah, I, I think the difference for me was that I was drawing on my childhood um, experiences and feelings for the, for Ash Mountain. Um, and the ones that I've set in Glasgow are very much, you know, where I've worked in my adult life. Um, they naturally tend to be crimier. Um, there was the sense of community, the community and the and the pacing. You're right, um, charity was really different in Ash Mountain. It's like nothing else that I've written, but I don't think it's just because it was rural. I think it's because of the sort of life experience that I was drawing on for it, probably. And you've all, we all have different life experiences before we write anything. And I can see, having read works from all of you, that there's a little bit of your lives that have bled into it in different ways and and how do you go about kind of drawing on that life stuff without making it too biographical I mean Kirsten you've uh you're one of several on our panel who, who've worked in, in criminal justice um in a way before you were a customs officer in New Zealand but, but then you worked in a family antiques store and your your time slip trilogy is a lot about antiques but also your dark thrillers your first one painted and your new one, The Forger and The Thief, are both in the arts world as well. So you're clearly tapping into that interest and, and that biography that you have yourself. Well, it's because I, I guess it's because I can, I understand it. So it just makes it easier to write if I'm not constantly running off to Wikipedia or Google or to the library. So it, and it, so it just flows, it's easier for the, those words around the scene setting or the, 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 the props, if you will, the props around my characters, they come quite easily. The characters require a little bit more work. Um, and listening to Charity and Helen talk about their scene setting, uh, um, Charity setting her her book in one cafe, that's what, essentially what I did with Dr. Perry by just throwing mm. everybody into one um, old person's home, retirement, you know, home after writing a time slip series that goes across three uh, continents and two centuries, I really wanted to write in one place. But even that, you know, the old people are surrounded by their, their mementos that they've saved. And it's those mementos that then you can form your character out of using those things that are around them. Like why have they kept a silver cup on the shelf? What, who's in the photo frame on the dresser? Um, do they have an amazing piece of jewellery that's a, a family heirloom that can take you back in time to then develop their backstory? So, so for me, my, my antique background growing up with it, um, that's so easy. So that's sort of my go-to. Um, I don't know whether I don't know whether other authors have a go-to easy side of their writing. That's my easy side. Uh, well, with Chris, you, you're. Your main hero, uh, Martin Skarsen, he's a journalist and you were a journalist yourself. So I imagine that that was kind of a, a leap that wasn't too difficult. Um, but then you could concentrate on the other things that were perhaps new to you as a crime writer. Is, is, was that the case? Or? Oh, for sure. I, I know a lot of writers really love the research aspect of, of writing crime, getting in there and finding out, you know, how courts work or how um, forensic science works, all that sort of stuff. I've got to admit, I, I just prefer making stuff up <laughs> and then trying to make it sound authentic. Um, so the journalism bit, I understand having worked as a journalist in both newspapers and television. But there were other aspects of crime writing that you know, I like to make up. And it was 
and funny is with this new book setting it in a real location you know sydney as opposed to you know a, a, a fictitious town but what i found with sydney i was kind of it's almost like an imagined sydney uh rather than the real place i mean i've lived there a couple of times on and off over the years so i know it quite well but i um i deliberately resisted all the obvious sort of touristy spots like the harbour and the opera house at Bondi and all of that because I found I just like you know making up locations more than I did sort of trying to depict real places. It's interesting what you say there about research Chris because I think that's it's always that thing you want to strike that balance between authenticity and credibility or veracity but not going too info dumpy which can be easy to do because the research can be so interesting. But I, I thought this might be a great time to jump to Emma because Emma's kind of done some very interesting research for the background of her character, Caleb Zalek. For those who haven't read it yet, and you really should, um, Caleb is a deaf private investigator and he's part of kind of floating in and out of the deaf world. He doesn't quite know where he fits, whether in the hearing world or in the deaf world, part of his journey and his character arc over the course of the series as well. But do you want to tell us, Emma, about the kind of research you did and why you wanted to have a deaf character as being a musician yourself before being a writer and the research you kind of did to try and um, make the character as authentic as possible. Yeah, it is actually, it ties in through what um, Kirsten was saying actually. It's, um, the research side of things and, and, and doing things that are comfortable. And, and I, when I first set out to write Resurrection Bay, I thought, I, I don't want it to be autobiographical at all. I don't want to set it in the music world at all, because that's my, my background as a classical musician, it seems to make sense. But I just went, oh, it's so boring. I just like the, the thought of it. I just went, oh, I just, I just can't, I don't, I don't want to write that. I don't want to read it. Um, so <laughs> when the idea first came to me for a deaf character, I thought, oh, that sounds fantastic. That's a great hook. Um, it'll make it really interesting. It'll make it really tense. And I also thought that's going to be way too hard and fraught. And I put this idea aside for like a good six months, maybe maybe longer. Um, but you know, when you when you're writing, you you often get this idea that just keeps coming back and keeps coming back. And I, I kept imagining Caleb's character, and and I always start with character. The the, the plot comes from the character and the character's decisions. Um, so Caleb was very much there in my mind. Um, so I sort of, I gave into it a little bit and, I, and I, I wrote a chapter, I wrote a scene and wrote a chapter, it kept going. I thought, okay, now I need to do some actual serious research. And, and a bit like Chris, um, I, I also am a, a little resistant to some forms of research. Like if I ever write a police, a police procedure, I, I am in deep trouble because um, I just like making that stuff up. Um, my locations are absolutely fictional. So the small town Resurrection Bay is an amalgamation of places I've lived in, but it's mainly just made up. Melbourne, I do very few. I, I, like I drop in a real place name, I drop, drop in the odd, but it, but it is actually my Melbourne in my head, not the real Melbourne. Um, so, but if you're writing outside your own experiences, like a deaf character, a deaf male character, uh, you do need to do some research. Okay, the male stuff is fine. I live with men. I've grown up with men. I teach teenage boys. That's, you know, I live in, you know, the a male world. That sort of side of things, I thought, okay, I, I can get into to Caleb's head the deaf stuff. <laughs> um, so, I started just reading um, people's memoirs, autobiographies, uh, blogs, things like that. And most of it's just empathy, just thinking what would it be like to go in the world uh, and not be able to hear. And then I thought, okay, but now I need to back it up with research. So first of all, I, I did a, a lip, an online lip reading course, thought I was eating a bit, thought I was just fantastic. Uh, put some earbuds in my ears, went out <laughs> into the world, tried to catch public transport, tried to order coffee, do my shopping, uh, failed miserably. Just appalling, just so hard. I am absolutely talentless when it comes to lip reading. Um, but I'd also thought along the way that Caleb might also use sign language. I needed to find a way of showing him comfortable in one area of his work life. And I also thought it'd be a really good way of showing the characters around him how close they were. So the characters who are close with him sign with him. Different degrees of fluency, some of them really badly, like his partner Frankie, some of them fluently, like his, his wife. 
Um, so I went and did a, a short lip reading course, uh, a sign language course, Auslan course to begin with, um, thinking maybe he will, maybe he won't. 10 minutes into it, I knew he was going to use Auslan. Uh, it just made so much sense for the character and the plot. So I then went on and did a, a TAFE course as well. It's one of those things where I think maybe I fell down the rabbit hole of research a little bit, um, but also you don't know what you don't know. And until I really got into to learning the language and meeting more and more people in the deaf community and hearing their stories and, and just learning about the life, I, I didn't know aspects of it. Um, th there were just whole worlds to it that I wasn't even aware existed, like tactile signing, where uh, if you are deaf blind, you actually hold the other person's hands as they sign and you can follow the language. So little things like that just seep into it. Um, yeah, and then I, I, I was gonna say I came out the other side, but I'm about to start another um, course on Monday, um, learning more sign language. So yeah, it's just one of those things, sometimes when you, when you get into it, you really get into it. I wanna have a wee chat with all of you about um, standalones versus series, because we have, um, three authors here that write series and three authors who've predominantly done standalones. Um, but just before we dive into that, I wanted to go to Alan, um, because Alan, you also have like a, a similar to Emma, but slightly different in that your character, Kato Kwong, in your West Australia set police series is an Asian Australian. So obviously very different background, very different experiences and perspectives to yourself. Um, how did you go about trying to kind of make him as authentic and real and nuanced as possible, not making it kind of a token thing, which I know that Emma was obviously very careful not to make Caleb a token thing, and he's so well around and such a great character, and Kato's the same, but kind of what did you do? Were you conscious of that, or did you just write it? Or were you very conscious of, I'm writing someone very different to me, I better not stuff up? Um, yeah, I was very conscious of um, what I was doing. Um, uh, and the, the pitfall, potential pitfalls of that. Uh, my previous background as a, a documentary maker, primarily for um, SBS, made me a bit more mindful of the issues of representation. Um, and so all of that I'm doing. I think um, in, in the first book, Prime Cut, I was very lazy in that um, uh, I made uh, Philip Kato Kwong basically um, not in touch with his um, cultural identity and therefore um, he would just, you know, he was, he was like me, he was, but he was 10 years younger, uh, a few kilos lighter and he could um, play piano, which I can't. Um, but as I went along by the third book, I realized I did have a debt to pay on that. Um, and so I had a, um, I was given a residency in Shanghai for a few months to write the third Cato book. Uh, and I used that opportunity to actually do some proper research about some of those issues that would face him. Uh, but all of the, the whole Cato series has undercurrents of um, the racism in Australian society and the things that he would face in, in work as an outsider, uh, potential outsider. Um, also, I, I was also in my documentary work I'd been doing um, in terms of the police procedural stuff. I, I was working on um, the force behind the line for a while, which is a, a cop reality show. So I was doing all of that, kicking down doors at two o'clock in the morning and running in with the cops with the camera on my shoulder. So I kind of saw all of that. By the time it got to the other series in New Zealand, uh, I was a lot more comfortable writing that because I was writing about Nick Chester, who's a, a Geordie who's stuck at the wrong end of a remote valley in New Zealand and wondering how the hell he got there, which is pretty much me. Um, so I knew how to do that and that felt very comfortable. I've also just finished a, a, a PhD on the whole issues of um, uh, the ethics of representation. Um, I realized how how closely I was skating to things while doing uh, Cato. Uh, anything I've done wrong in the past, I apologize forthwith, but I have tried my best. <laughs> um, but it's a really interesting series to write and it does give me an opportunity to, to explore some of those things that um, are less comfortable about Australian society. Um, and, and, the, 
and they're very visible and it's not such an undercurrent of racism that's out there big time um, and for a cop to be facing that as well as trying to find the bad guys um, I find very interesting. Yeah I and mean, we could do a whole a whole hour-long panel with all of us on the issues of representation in crime fiction I think I mean it's a a fascinating topic. I actually got into a small tw Twitter conversation with a with a Canadian Indigenous Canadian writer today, uh, earlier today or yesterday, um, because I'd uh, shared some books set in Alaska that had Inuit characters because um, I wanted to focus on um, diverse characters, um, but they were all written by non-Indigenous writers, and he made the point of that may not be a good thing and. And it, it's tricky because um, I know, for instance, in New Zealand, we never really had a lot of Maori characters in crime fiction um, prior to Paul Thomas, who's um, English born, but lived almost all his life in Australia and New Zealand, um, brought in Tito Ihaka, and there was one back in the 50s as well. Um, we didn't necessarily have Maori writers writing Maori characters, but we didn't have anyone writing Maori characters. And the same with Aboriginal characters in Australia. You have someone like Adrian Highland, and, and or, um, sorry, it's... Uh, Right, Diamond Dove, the Emily Tempest books, the names just escaped me, who writes those. Adrian Highland, yeah. It is Adrian Highland, yeah, Gunshot Road and Diamond Dove and stuff. And and I know that he faced a lot of criticism when they first came out about having a, a female Aboriginal character as the main character. But if it's kind of, is it a good thing for people to at least have these characters out there or should we only be allowing people who are those characters, so to speak, to write them in? we could go into that for hours. So perhaps we'll leave that for questions after the two or something with the people to discuss in the comments section. But I wanted to dive in uh, with Helen um, because you've had a, a very long career. In fact, you've been writing the longest out of any of us here, I think, um, in terms of being a published author. Um, and you've largely done standalones the whole way through, which is rather unusual in crime fiction in that um, so many crime writers have at least one series or a mini series or a three or five book series and stuff like that. And you, you've had a very long, very successful career. Um, um, you know, The Cry was adapted for BBC. It was wonderful. It was like everyone in the UK was watching it. Um, great, you know, awards, shortlistings, and very successful doing standalones. And, and that's, um, was that an intentional thing on your part? Did you ever have a book where you went, I'd like to bring that character back again? Um, or would, would you kind of get bored with a series character? I get bored. Yeah, I get bored. And I never want to have to read my books again. And I figure I'd have to read my, the, you know, like I'd have to read it again to, to make sure a continuity stuff. And I just really don't want to have to ever read any of my books ever again. So that was one of the reasons. But the Dead Lovely, the very first one, I'd half written a second book when it was Alan and Unwin was my first publisher, actually. They bought the second one and encouraged me to write the same character and do a sequel, which they bought before they published the first one. So they bought my first two books. But the first book bombed, and so she cancelled the second one. And I went, it was a, just a really bad book. I mean, I won't tell you which one it is. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll find out, my last confession. But it was just, it was bad. And there are a lot of reasons why it was bad, but I think it probably put me off, actually, even trying to do that. Until worst case scenario, which I wrote very deliberately thinking of, um, you know, a sequel, at least in TV, if it ever got made, if not uh, book form. But as I said, I, I haven't started on it. I'm thinking now what to do next. And it might, it might be a sequel to uh, worst case scenario, but She's I will have to read wonderful that. Character. She's a wonderful character. I'm not sure if um, others here have read that, but that's a, it's a menopausal parole officer in Glasgow who basically tries to set up one of her parolees who she thinks might be dangerous. And literally like the title, everything that could go wrong goes wrong. It's like one of those black comic farce movies where it just goes down and down and down and worse and worse and worse. And it's, oh, sorry, I almost, I don't know if we're allowed to swear here. We could swear on stage, maybe not on YouTube. Um, it's effing brilliant. It's really, really good. And I'd love to see her back. Well, I think it could still get worse for her. So there might be a, another book in there, but I don't know. I, I do get bored and I always really enjoy making up new characters and settings. Um, but I might run out. I am, I am running out of ideas, so. <laughs> for you, Kirsten, you've, uh, like your three thrillers, or your kind of horror thrillers and dark thrillers, they're all standalones. But then your other books that you've written are actually kind of a linked series, the time slip 
books, there's, you know, those links between them. So for you, you, you know, what, what made you decide um, whether to be series or standalone when it comes to each book? And when you're writing it, when do you know whether it might be a series or standalone book? Well, when I started writing 15 postcards and then I wrote its sequel, The Last Letter, and because they're historically based, I was so tired of the, um, the research. And although I was contracted to write the third one, I just took a small break and I sat down and wrote, painted in a, in a very short period of time. And it was so refreshing to write something that wasn't connected to anything else. And I loved that process so much that then I wrote um, Dr. Perry very quickly as well. Meanwhile, my contract for the third book in my series was I had to ask for a bit of an extension without telling my publisher that I was busy writing these standalones for someone else. So, um, but it was really refreshing, like Helen says, to, to write something fresh and new and not, not um, have to rely on a previous book. I don't have to have a, a story origin Bible to go back and check the colored eyes of Elijah Cohn or um, of Dr. Perry or of, the, of Pauline in the kitchen. So that's why I decided that um, I've now finished my trilogy, of course, and it's doing, it's doing very well. It's not Newcastle Noir appropriate, but it's, do, it's doing really well. I've got my two standalones with a third standalone coming in. But I also kind of like the idea of a series and, and, the, um, and that. So I've picked a couple of small characters from Painted oh, and I've okay. just woven them in just a tiny, tiny bit, just to I, almost like little Easter eggs for somebody to find mm. if, they, if they look hard enough. But then oh, after that, I'll go back to another time slip trilogy because... Um, to be to be brutally honest, they make more money than my standalones. Um, yeah, I always loved uh, Paul Cleave, the Christchurch author, who does very well in Germany and France over here um, in Europe. Uh, he kind of did a little bit the same with the little Easter eggs for people because uh, his first 10 books of his 11, his most recent ones set in small town uh, rural America. But the first 10 are all set in Christchurch. But only five of them are kind of a loose series with one private eye slash cop slash private eye. A little bit like Harry Bosch in Michael Connolly's books. He's in and out of the police force kind of thing. Um, and the other five uh, aren't about him. But characters from the ten books all kind of overlap. Like someone who's a main character in one will appear as a background character in another, whether it's a prison visit or something like that. So it's the, the same world in the 10 books, even if the protagonists are different. I love, I, love, I love finding that in other people's books. It's, it's part of the joy, isn't it? You, you become your own sleuth reading somebody's books. And Chris, Emma and Alan, I wanted to ask you, as you, you've all written a kind of multi-book series, um, Chris, you've got the third one coming out. So you've all written series that are kind of three or more books. Did you, when did you know during the first book, um, whether it was Prime Cut or Resurrection Bay or Scrublands, when did you know that it might be a series? Was it, did you know before you started partway through, do you like, oh, I've got too much to say about this character? Or was it later on that you just couldn't get the character out of your head when you were thinking of the next book? So you went back to it. So Chris, for you, when did you know that Martin was going to be more than one book? <laughs> I did something incredibly stupid in retrospect and it, that was to set out to write a trilogy um, and I don't mean a series of three books I mean a real trilogy with storylines going over three books and um, it wasn't until I approached an agent um, her, her assistant read a first draft of Scrublands and went no no one's going to publish this because it's not resolved and as soon as he said it it was like well duh obvious but what what that meant was when I finished Scrublands I still had all these storylines that, that were bubbling away so in that sense it was kind of a natural to go uh, to move uh, to have more books with the same characters I must say I admire very much people who, who write standalone because you know you have to reinvent the wheel mm. every time on the other hand I think in my book there's a definite limit to how many books I can um, do in a series because an important part of them is, uh, as well as the crime stories, it's the emotional journey of, of Martin and his um, partner, Mangalay. Um, 
and so there's only a limited a limited extent you can do that. So I'm not sure what the limit is, whether it's three books, whether it's five books, whatever. But at some stage, I'm going to have to to um, do a couple of standalones or start a new series or or something like that. But no, it was really really even before Scrublands was published, I guess that I was thinking of of, a, of a, some sort of series. Mm. And uh, just before we go to Emma and Alan uh, talking about uh, your series characters, uh, Charity, have you ever thought of doing a series character of any of your, um, like in the, especially in your recent books, which are kind of your, you've had um, your kind of genre blending books and suspense and stuff, but the most recent ones have been the, probably the most crime thriller, psychological thriller-esque. Have you ever thought of um, bringing in a series character or bringing one of the characters back that keeps talking to you even after the book's closed? It's really tempting. Uh, the second was crime psychological thriller, probably too. It's really tempting because, as with a, as you all know, with a standalone, you have to start again, reinvent the world. And I love the research and spend months and months researching. It's really time consuming, and the sort of the economic effects of that time spent researching every time, learning this new world, and you and I t take ages getting into characters. You know, I really get to know them and listen to them and. Um, sort of work out what they'll be carrying in their handbags and and it all is very time consuming so by the time I'm actually writing the actual story and it's turning into a real book you know it takes takes ages we all know that so it's really tempting to re to revisit one of those worlds and I might do this most recent one has a crisis negotiator called Eliza who um, I think could could appear again and I was really interested in that crisis negotiation thing. I do um, telephone crisis line listening sometimes. And so I was able to use some of those skills, you know, about how you listen actively on a telephone and the sort of speech patterns of the people you're talking to. So that saved me a bit of research time that, that you were talking about um, before. And it's really tempting to kind of reuse that. And I like that character. So maybe... But um, the one I'm in the middle of at the moment is another standalone. There's a new one, crime thriller. Have we have we fully pulled you into our dark web? Or? Oh, it's only. <laughs> I might I might do more of that in the future. There's normally a crime at the centre. In all, I was thinking about it before joining this panel. In in all but two of them, there is a crime in there. You know, somebody somebody done somebody in, or somebody's happened. Um, and but as I say, it's normally about why they did it, not who did it. And and the same is true in this one I'm writing at the moment. But it is another standalone. But there's often what you talk about. There's Easter eggs, um, Kirsten. There's often a couple of those, um, which you'll find if you look really hard. But they're they're tiny. You know, just the name of a law firm or something like that. It's just my. It's just me being narcissistic, really. <laughs> That's fantastic. And Emma, with Caleb, did you know, um, when did you know you were going to bring him back for more than one story? Uh, when, when I first started writing Resurrection Bay, um, probably actually even before, um, mm -hmm. I, I do a really deep dive into the characters. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm in their head or they're in my head or what it is, but um, so I, I, I really enjoy getting to know them, but, but also... I really want them to change. And like Chris was saying before, it, it's about the emotional journey of the characters. So I always knew that I wanted to show Caleb in particular, but the people around him also mm. changing. Um, so when, when bad things happen or when good things happen, the characters change. And so I, I wanted to see that over a longer arc. And you can do that within a book, absolutely. Um, but I thought over a, a three or five books or something like that, um, and it was funny, actually, that Chris said three or five, because I was thinking three or five, and I was writing the third novel. It's just come out, Darkness for Light, and, and I was having a lot of trouble with it, and I, I couldn't work out why until I realised um, there was actually two books, and I, it was going to have to be a four-book series, because five seemed too much, but I couldn't get over the fact that I was writing an even number. Mm. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't cope with a four-book series, um, and my publisher said, you can write four books you don't have to write three or five um it, it is something that can be done <laughs> and so until I got my head around the fact that it could be four uh, I did struggle but when I realized that I could do that um I then had my number that it's, it's going to be a four book series um 
And then I kept getting other ideas for the series, but, but it, it seemed like it needed an end also because things can't keep happening without um, any repercussions to the characters. So I thought, well, I'll finish. I'm, I'm writing the fourth now. I'll finish. I'll write a standalone or two. And we might have lost Emma there. Is she frozen for other people or just me? Yeah, frozen for me. Okay. We'll come back to her when she comes back. I'm thinking that she might be saying that she might be coming back to Caleb after a standalone or two if she's been refreshed and things like that, which are, uh, several um, crime writers have done. Uh, I know uh, even in, uh, in Australia, John John Cleary was writing um, kind of his Scobie Malone books before Peter Corris wrote his Cliff Hardy ones. And even though he was an Australian detective, he set most of them overseas. That thing we were talking about before, being told not to set books in Australia. And it wasn't until Corris had his Cliff Hardy books and they kind of went okay. Hello. That John came back and started setting Scobie Malone books actually in Sydney. And there was quite a big gap in between until he came back. Sorry, we were just trying to guess what your answer might be there, Emma. But if you want to give us the real answer, uh, that after doing some standalones, you might come back to Caleb later, kind of feeling more refreshed and of having a break and how some authors have a break in a series, but do go back to a character years later, sometimes even 10 or 15 years later. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. M might be more a case of giving Caleb a break than me a break. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And was that a consideration for you, Alan? Because you wrote, I think it was three Kato Kwong books, and then you did your Nick Chester book set in New Zealand, then you went back to Kato for book four. Now you're going back to Nick for book two in that series. So a couple of things for you. When did you know Nick would be a, a series rather than a standalone? And, and was that kind of a consideration to kind of refresh yourself between the locations and characters? Um, it, it does feel like uh, every time it's a change of scenery, literally, uh, but also it's a change of voice as well with the the Cato series being in the, the third person past and uh, the New Zealand Nick Chester series, first person present. So I just get to be able to think in a very different way when I'm doing them. Um, plus with Nick Chester, I get to um draw upon everything i, re I recall about um the the geordie mindset which can be quite scary at times um so i, I really enjoy writing uh, nick chester i wasn't sure he would ever be um i wasn't sure that either either of them would ever become a series uh with prime cut with the kato series i was just happy to get a book published um, and then if people liked it, I would, um, I, I left it open at the end with the chance of coming back for more. Likewise with Nick Chester, um, the same. And, and so there will be a, another one with Nick, um, Doom Creek due out later this year. I, I've also already written the next Cato book, which is coming out next year. Um, and this is kind of a Newcastle Noir exclusive, but I've got a feeling that that will probably be the last one but probably will probably be the operative word as well because you never say never. Um, but uh, I think uh, Nick seems to be taking over um, for the immediate future. Um, there's, uh, I'm feeling very comfortable writing that character. Um, I don't have any worries about the ethics of representation because he's a grumpy middle-class Geordie just like me. Middle-class and middle-aged, sorry. Um, so that's e easy enough to do. Um, I suppose as long as my memory of New Zealand lasts, I can, I can write that one. But uh, as I've been away from there for about a year now, those are also receding. I can still write about the Waka Marina Valley pretty um, straightforwardly. But um, it, it is funny now being in yet another place, uh, Tasmania, uh, where I'm normally used to writing about what I can see out my window which is in New Zealand and in Perth. Um, it's different again here, but I'm not going to have a third series in Tasmania. I couldn't juggle that many things. Cato could get a case in Tasmania or something. But... Uh, well, I have actually got Cato's uh, offside having a little tour of Tassie in that next book coming out. <laughs> just <go> a, <laughs> but just a small one. Yeah. Did, you, um, did you find that hard, Helen, kind of what... Alan's mentioned then about having been away for a while and, and things like that. Did you find that hard writing Ash Mountain, but having been away from Australia 
for a long time, even if you visit, um, you know, it's different yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. So. Absolutely. And I feel really nervous about it coming out and about what, you know, what my family will say and what um, people in my town will say, you know, because I haven't lived there for so long. It does feel, it is a little different. Even from writing from Glasgow too, I, I also felt I didn't really, I don't know, have the, the same feeling about sense of place that other people writing about Glasgow have, having grown up here. Um, but yeah, it was different. It was a different experience, and I am nervous about it coming out. Oh, it's really good. I don't think you've got to worry. It's a really good book. So <laughs> I think people will like. It. I love the setting, and being a kind of New Zealander who spent time in Australia and grew up in a small town in New Zealand, it definitely rang true to me. So. Yeah, I mean, that, the town I grew up in is uh, Kilmore, just outside of Melbourne. Um, and it's just, yeah, I, ha I just haven't been there for so long. And I think it's gone, it's gone through a lot, of more, a lot more trouble since I've left it too. So um, I think people there might not like, even though I've said Ash, it's Ash Mountain, it's not Kilmore. Um, but I, don't, I would hate to sort of be mean about it. Do you know what I mean? So you've kind of done a fictional version of a real place, a little bit like Chris did in his first two books. So. Yeah. Because I imagine that you actually had a specific place, or at least a, at least a condensation of a few specific places in mind for both of your first two books. Chris, even if you gave them a fictional title or a fictional place name, rather. Uh, the the uh, the location in the in the uh, first book, Scrublands, is real, but the town does not mm. is in mm. in the town out there because the towns out there are very spread out, mm. so it didn't really work for the plot. Uh, Scrubland, uh, Silver is set somewhere on the north coast of New South Wales. I did a book tour just at the end of last year and I drove all the way pretty much from Newcastle up to Brisbane. It was fantastic because every town I stopped in, you know, library events, bookstore events, everyone was completely convinced that I'd based <laughs> the fictitious town Port Silver on their town. So um, <laughs> I, I was very happy about that. <laughs> Uh, you definitely got those je ne sais quoi of the towns then if they all think it's them. So. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I was curious to, to get your all, all of your perspectives kind of on the the so-called rise of crime writing in recent years. I mean, it actually dates back to the 1800s. We had authors that were doing well on a global scale, even in the 1800s and the 1930s and the 1950s, even if we've forgotten some of them. But there definitely does seem to be a sense of a boom or a, a, a wave, if you want, that we're all surfing now. Do you feel that as Australian and New Zealand authors? Is there, is there a, a growing sense of community? Is there a growing sense of your, your part of something with your compatriots and things like that? I'm going to leave that open to whoever wants to answer first. Definitely. I mean, events like this. I think, Craig, you've had a big impact on, for me, you know, just being introduced to people and having the panels at Newcastle and at other festivals. Uh, there's a much bigger presence at the festivals over here in the last few years. Yeah, I, I think when, when I was first... Oh, you go, Chris. Uh, thanks, Emma. Um, we've just had the uh, Abia Book Awards here in Australia, the Australian Book Industry Awards. Mm. And in the general fiction category, eight or eight and a half out of ten books on the long list were crime fiction books. Yeah. So no historical fiction, or maybe one, Silver's Journey, which you can say that's historical fiction. No romance, no speculative fiction, just pretty much wall-to-wall -wall crime. And I've, I've pretty much read all of them, and they're all fantastic. Mm. Um, and certainly, you know, I'm... Scrublands was published just two years ago, so I'm relatively new to this game. But one of the things I've really enjoyed about it is meeting other Australian crime writers because it really is um, a sense of collegiality. People really do get on well, um, swap stories, uh, enjoy each other's successes. It's, it's been one of the joys, I must say, of having that book published. Yeah, yeah, I you think yeah, I think it's a, a really supportive community. Um, mm. it, it's been a really interesting, um, the, the, the recent popularity, the recent international popularity has been a really interesting one. I mean, it's obviously a fantastic <laughs> situation to be in, but um, I came in, uh, Resurrection Bay was published just before international interest took off. Mm. It was a really interesting um, uh, sort of wave 
to to be a part of. Um, when, when I was first writing it, um, I actually someone um, a publisher actually said, "I oh, don't write Australian crime fiction set in Australia. No one wants to read it in Australia or overseas." And this was only um, five six years ago. Yeah, yeah. So Resurrection Bay came out in two thousand and fifteen. Mm. So this is probably uh, two thousand and fourteen. Um, someone said this to me, and and I was at the stage where I thought, "Well, I, I've." pretty much written this manuscript. I'm, I'm on the final draft at the moment. What am I going to do? And I, and I thought, well, I'm going to keep going because this is what I'm enjoying writing. This is what I, I really, really, really want to write. I want to write about society and people and the good and terrible things they do. So I'm just going to keep going. And if I whack it up on Amazon and, you know, one person reads it, I guess that's what's going to happen. And then it was published and already you could feel that Australia was changing because it got a lot of interest in Australia. And that's, I think, through the work of uh, a lot of people. There's um, the Ned Kelly Awards have been going for ages and Sisters in Crime with the David Awards, you, mm -hmm. Craig, getting interest as well. Um, so, and, and then we've got this long list of fantastic writers who have come before. You've got Peter Corris and Peter Temple, Gary Disher, um, mm -hmm. all, all the way back to the Hanson Cab, as you're saying, you know, yeah. back uh, 100 years ago. Um, and then, of course, um, we, we had the great um, outbreak with uh, the dry, which got international attention. And then suddenly international publishers went, oh, wow, and opened the door and saw all these great writers out there. And suddenly we all started getting published overseas as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it just seems to have been, we, we're coming off a base of some really long-term great writers and then some organisations and individuals who have really helped support it. So I think it's been a coming together of a, a number of things. Uh, just before Ellen, Kirsten and Charity, you kind of share your perspectives on that. I think, yeah, I think it's really important to acknowledge those organisations. And um, I, I want to do a particular shout out to Sisters in Crime in Australia, because they actually started before the Australian Crime Writers Association. They started back in 1991. And the Australian Crime Writers Association was like 95, 96 when they started the Ned Kelly Awards. And um, Sisters in Crime started um, and you've probably talked to Lindy and, and Carl, Carmel and that about this, Emma. But they only had there was only two or three or four published women crime writers in Australia at the time, and so it was more of a readers' group. Where Sisters in Crime in America, which was started by Sarah Paretsky, the great Sarah Paretsky of the Wachowski Tales, um, was very much a writers' group. Whereas the Australian one was very much a readers' group, hoping to encourage writers. And um, yeah, I mean, so the last 30 years, it's been a massive uptake and, and now you're seeing, um, sorry, Alan and Chris, but it's the Australian women writers that are often dominating a lot of the time. And I, I just was t chatting to a British journalist yesterday about Southern Cross Crime and I went through and tallied up and I'd just done it kind of trying to be as representative and diverse as I could, but also just being fair. I wasn't intentionally weaving in any one way. 53% of the novelists are women in it, in the book about Australian and New Zealand crime writing. And 30 years ago, there were three or four active Australian women crime writers. And now you see how many entries, the Davits and the Scarlet Stilettos and that every year. And that's, that's down to sisters in crime, basically, and, and how they've encouraged things. And Ned Kelly's have done it, and the Nyos in New Zealand with many others as well. But um, yeah, it, it's kind of, they did build it, and, and now it's come to... Uh, Kind of like yeah, misquote. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you see, <laughs> when you see uh, other people, sorry, okay. you go ahead. No, 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 you, no, you go. go ahead. <laughs> I was yeah. saying, when, when you see that many people around you writing, you are, mm. you think that it's possible. Mm. So you start writing yourself for publication. I mean, obviously, we've all been writing along the way. So you see. Um, women getting published and you go, oh, okay, I don't have to write a certain way. Uh, so yeah, Sisters in Crime, I think has, has been a big part of that boom, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, at the beginning of the year when I set my Goodreads reading challenge of 50 books and I self-imposed, I had to read 50% male authors, 50% female authors, 50% New Zealand authors and 50% around the world authors. And just on my bookcase from my, my haul from um, Rotorua Noir last year, I've been going through all those female authors, thanks Craig, and, um, and the New Zealand crime writers. And they, those are books that I'm looking forward to reading. That, I, that 
they aren't necessarily on the front and center of the Whitpool's bookshelves, but they, they're the books that are front and center in all the little independent bookstores that I go to. Mm. So there's a lot of love that's coming towards um, crime writers and um, in those smaller pockets. I, I feel like Whitpool's, and I'm not sure what the Australian equivalent is, are still somewhat stuck on the, in the Dan Brown, um, you know, big Lee Child tomes, but everyone else is, has moved. All those independent bookstores have moved to, we want to support local, we want to support diversity, we have a diverse clientele, and we have to provide books for them. And I think that's helped a lot, um, female crime writers and, uh, say, um, uh, with a protagonist who's an Asian Australian policeman, you know, that's helped a lot. And Craig, you've had a lot to do with that. Thank you so much. And um, Sisters in Crime and everything that Jackie's done and the internet. I mean, I couldn't have imagined meeting so many helpful people if it wasn't for the groups that have popped up and that I've joined over the years. Mm. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And uh, Craig, I think what the NIOs have made a tremendous difference to uh, to you know, awareness. They've got those books into those little independent bookshops. And the Murder in the Library series, mm -hmm. which is really well attended and it gets people out there. And I've read, I've met um, lots of authors through that series that I probably wouldn't have met otherwise and have become aware of them, have begun to read their books. And they're, they're really well attended, as you know. So I think that's just at a sort of grassroots level, that's changed awareness a lot. I mean, of course, there's a magnificent history of crime writing in New Zealand going back um, an awfully long way. And, you know, I was aware of, of those, Naya Marsh and um, people like Paul Cleave, but just as recently, there was all those others. There's sort of great army of others, other crime and mystery writing, which I do think that Naya's have really helped us along. I think, yeah, when you set up the awards or an organisation like Sisters in Crime, Australian Crime Writers Association, the NIOs, which are really an award, but they're kind of a de facto organisation, effectively. Um, yeah, because I know that each of them, when I've talked to the organisers of each of them, uh, talking to myself as, as, as in New Zealand's case, um, but, uh, you know, th there was only a handful of books, a handful of entrants or whatever in the first year, and four or five years down the track, there were two or three dozen, and eight or ten years down the track you've got 70 entrants and it's amazing how it grows when people see that it's like a it's a, it's a point you made I think is, Emma is like it's a legitimate thing to do almost like um, we're having literary writers in New Zealand now who are very established suddenly write their first crime novel after 15 books like they see that it's a like it's a, a way that they can tell stories and they can tell stories set in their own country and they might not have written crime fiction anymore, but now they've decided to write a crime or a thriller or a psychological suspense. And you're seeing literary Australian authors and, and others, as well as all the first time crime writers, which is really wonderful. I wish we could keep talking about this for another two or three hours, so I can probably get away with a few more minutes. Um, perhaps if we want to go around the group and you'd all like to recommend a couple of Australian or New Zealand authors you really like from people outside of this little group because I'm going to recommend all of you to everyone <laughs> because you're all wonderful but is there a particular author or two that you've enjoyed reading recently or just one that you're very interested to read even if you haven't read I'm, I'm going to say um, Nikki Crutchley who's the Cambridge author she's had mm. two uh, two standalone thrillers out both set in small town New Zealand uh, and I'm really excited about what Ever it is that she's going to be bringing out next. Her latest delay is released, sadly. Yeah, um, it was going to come out soon, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. So um, I'm really, I'm really, I love her reading. I love her style of writing, and she is the most, the nicest person you've ever met as well. Yeah, that's a nothing bad happens here as her first one, like yeah, a play bad. on the small town where nothing bad ever happens, and of course, lots of bad things happen. So, yeah, yeah, she's. She's great. And Alan, is there any authors you particularly enjoy lately or want to get to during lockdown? So. Um, oh, there's a whole bunch of um, the usual suspects. I really like Gary Dish's work, for instance, mm. and uh, Marlon Nunn. Um, mm. uh, yeah, a nice right originally from, I think, Swaziland or South Africa. But she writes a great series about a, a 
detective called Edward Cooper set in um, early apartheid era South Africa. But one book I'd really like to draw people's attention to, and I think you've uh, mentioned it in your own uh, new book, Craig, is uh, that Charlotte J book, Beat Not the Bones. Oh, yes. Uh, written in 1952 by um, uh, a woman who previously had been a court stenographer up in uh, PNG. And, and this book in 1952 is just an amazing, vivid, um, uh, kind of it's a, an, an incisive work on, on Australian colonialism and colonialism and racism in general, generally about a woman who goes to PNG to find out what happened to her husband and explores the um, exploitation of that country and of that people. Uh, and it's just a really fascinating book and I'd really recommend it uh, as from somebody you might not have heard of or even an era you might have thought not, not have thought, thought of. But uh, for a book written in 1952, which is so um, telling about the Australian position, I think it's a fantastic book. Yeah. Interestingly, for those, um, you, you may not know this, because I only recently found this out myself in the last six months, is that that book won the first ever Edgar Award for Best Novel in the That's United right. States. Yes. Um, yeah. there, were, there were Edgar Awards for other categories, like first novel and that previous, but it was the very first time they ever gave out the big, big Daddy Best Novel Award. And it was won by an Australian writing a book set in New Guinea, an Australian woman writing a book set in New Guinea back in the 50s. Raymond Chandler oh, won, the next Raymond year, won, won the next year. So that's yeah. kind of the era we're talking about. So. Yeah. And Charity, do you have some authors you're looking forward to? Or? Um, I'm looking forward to reading um, the, late, the, the first crime novel by Nalini Singh. Mm. I met her on a panel with her um, a while ago and um, you know I, I was aware of the other sorts of books she's written but I think that's going to be really interesting I haven't read it yet um, and uh, Renee as you know at the age of 90 wrote her first crime novel which I have read The Wild Card mm. and that's really fun to read it's really fun to see her take on crime and I also read um, Greg McGee's two books when he's writing is Alex Bosco he was the inaugural winner of the Nio Marshall Award, wasn't he? Cut and yeah. run, yeah. Won, won the first Nio Marshall Award in 2010. We had a mystery winner around Mystery Award <laughs> because they didn't show up to get it because they were a pseudonym. And I so thought it was a woman. And Val McDermott would have sworn it was a woman as well because he wrote that middle-aged woman kind of legal research character so well that both Val McDermott and I were sure it was a female author writing under another name, and it turned out to be a six foot six rugby playing bloke who'd written plays called Foreskin's Lament about rugby locker rooms 30 years ago. Right. That's quite extraordinary. Yeah, so those are fun. I read both of those. Um, and it is funny, you, yes, you're right. You feel the voice is really, really female, whatever that mm. means. I agree with you. Yeah, I wish he'd write a third one of that, but I think he struggles now that he's come out. Um, and everyone knows it's like hard to go back to that character again, which is a shame because I think he was originally going to do three. So. And Helen? Yeah, we heard. Um, so I've just finished, uh, finally got around to reading Van der Simon's um, first one. And, oh, Overkill. Uh, yeah. yeah, Overkill, which I, I absolutely loved. And there's another two, isn't there? So that's what I'll hopefully read next. Um, I've also just gotten around to reading Jane Harper's The Dry as well. So I'm just dipping in and I've got... Um, Audible now, so I've got, I've kind of got a queue of a lot of books that I'm going to listen to over the next little while. Nice, you've got some good reading ahead. So. Yeah. And Chris? Um, look, I've just read this book. It isn't out yet. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a New Zealand author called Rose Carlyle, The Girl in the Mirror. Uh, it's already sold into the US. It's also already been sold in the film deal. Um, it's a really compelling book, but it's incredibly entertaining and funny. So it's a kind of funny thriller. Mm. Uh, it's a bit hard, hard to explain. It's about identical twins, uh, The Girl in the Mirror. So it, uh, it's out in Australia in August, but I'm sure it'll be published in, in the UK as well. It's a great book. I'm jealous. It's actually um, very rare for a New Zealand crime novel to come out that I don't know about, and I don't know about that one. So good work, Chris. You well, caught me out there. Ask, ask Alan and Armin. I'm, I'm sure they'll send you a copy. Yeah, brilliant. And Emma, have we heard something from you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a big fan of Malanun as well. And mm. um, 
I'm actually a bit behind on my reading with her. So she's someone I definitely need to pick up a, her last um, couple of books. Um, it's, it's not out. I don't even know if it's written, but I'm really looking forward to um, Lynn Vincent McCarthy's next book. She wrote a book called Lonely Girl a couple of years ago, set in Tasmania. It was incredibly gothic, really dark. Um, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it except by saying it's a really gothic story where a, a woman basically kidnaps someone she suspects of murder. And um, it's not really my usual kind of book, but it was so um, mesmerising, really, that I'm just really keen to read more of her work. Um, and she's uh, Lynn Vincent McCarthy. She's uh, originally a screenwriter. And, and sometimes when you get um, books written by playwrights or screenwriters, you get this fantastic dialogue, but you don't get much of the world. Um, but she's managed to establish this fantastic, uh, eerie, immersive landscape that I really sank into. So I'm, I'm just watching out for her work, really. Fantastic. Lots to look forward to from Australian and New Zealand crime writing, all the authors that have been mentioned here and all the authors on screen. I've read all the books that they, well, I've read books from all of them and they're all well worth reading. I would highly recommend you go grab yourself a copy of a Charity Norman book, a Helen Fitzgerald book, a Chris Hammer book, an Alan Carter book, a Kirsten McKenzie book or an Emma Biscuit book. You can't get them from the bookshop at Newcastle Noir because we're not there in person this year. Hopefully back next year, you can find them online or from your favorite local bookstore, wherever you are. Ask them to get them in if they're not there on the shelves. You won't regret it. I've been Craig Sisterson. Thank you so much for joining us for this Antipode and Noir panel. And thank you very much to all of you for calling in late at night in the UK or early in the morning in Australia and New Zealand. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much.